Jersey court had indicted Hauptmann on kidnapping and murder. Arrested in New York, he was arraigned on criminal extortion charges and put under heavy bail pending extradition. More than two years after the actual kidnapping, the arrest of Hauptmann caused a national sensation. Charles A. Lindbergh, grim and shaken after his appearance to testify, was still America's great popular hero. His ordeal as a bereaved parent was an anguished memory. The present had become a nightmare for another parent, Hauptmann's wife, who clung to their infant son. Welcome to the NJ Criminal Podcast and part two in this series. Talk to me a little bit about the uh, the ransom notes um, and you know the the initial investigation um, and how those ransom notes uh, tie in to uh, the 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 idea that John Knoll was in fact uh, involved with Haltman. Well, I could get into very deep detail about this, but I will, for the, from the beginning, I will just say that there was a symbol in the in in the ransom notes. Uh, um, there were 15 notes in in total, and there were they there was a symbol on note notes number one, two, four, six, and seven, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, and fourteen, and it was a symbol composed of two uh it was called a signature uh it was referred to as a signature in uh the ransom notes it was a there were two interlocking blue circles that were stamped onto the page uh they are the, exactly the size of half dollars and in the area of intersection it was a uh mark made with a cork i would say it is between the size of a dime and the size of a pin. Uh, you, know, you know, you'll read books about it. There's, I've never seen it accurately described. There are two, there are two little lines that are in the circles, one in each circle outside the area of intersection. And there are three holes punched through the, uh, the signature. One that pierces the, one that pierces the red dot uh and cork mark and then uh, the other two to the uh just outside the edges of the blue circles and so this was a way that Lindbergh could know and the police could know that they were dealing with the bona fide kidnappers of their son rather than with copycats where uh, where they, were the ransom notes discovered well the, the well the, the the first one was left on the windowsill of the baby's n- nursery and then the others were then mailed from different locations. Um, uh, just you know, again, John Knoll is a, a a philatelist, a stamp collector. Is this is his great passion, and he knows all about cancellations. And you know that he's going to confuse people by mailing some from the Bronx, some from Brooklyn, some from Manhattan, and so forth. So. That's that. That also is, uh, you know, a fact that that <clears throat> certainly a philatelist. It's a, something a clever philatelist would have done. What's interesting to me is that you know, in today's day and age, those notes could have been analyzed for uh, different types of forensic evidence, DNA, etc. And obviously, this this all occurred well before any of that. I'm interested in how the investigation and the trial would have uh, been different had the crime happened today. Um, So the the case, though, was very dependent on handwriting analysis, correct? Yeah, the, 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 well, the, the, the most damning things to uh, Altman were, were, of course, he's found with $14,600 of the $50,000 ransom. And this was uh, most of the money was squirreled away in secret compartments. Most of the money was squirreled away in secret compartments in his garage. Not a good fact for him. Pardon me. It's not a good fact for him, right? No, not a good fact at all. (laughs) And also, there were the the, Hamlin was a carpenter, 
and he was a he was a very talented carpenter. I mean, he was a very um, he was a very, he was you know he he was not the imbecile that a lot of people have have portrayed him to be. This was a very inventive device that he created. You couldn't have found anything like it in the Sears or Montgomery Ward catalogs of the day, which was the the equivalent of Amazon back then. Um, but the ladder was made in sections that could be transported in his 1930 Dodge DD sedan so that the sections would nest. There were three sections that nested into one another and they could be fit into his sedan to go from the front windshield to, to the rear window and with a few inches to spare. And they were connected. The sections were connected with dowel pins. As it turned out, only two of the sections were needed. And the third unused section had a, was called rail 16 was one of the rails. And as it turns out, that rail was once shown. Uh, uh, there was a wood expert named Arthur Kaler who came from Wisconsin to to uh, do forensic work on the, on the ladder. And Kaler determined that this rail 16 was once part of the same piece of wood as a floorboard in, in Houtman's attic. There was a little gap in between, but you could see where the wood grain, the, the, the lines of the wood grain would match up. So this was a very, 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 very uh, damning thing for, for Houtman as well. And then uh, when Lindbergh, Lindbergh, on the night that the ransom was paid, drove the intermediary Condon to St. Raymond Cemetery. And from a distance, and uh, there was a man inside the cemetery calling out for Dr. Condon. He said, hey, doctor. Uh, and anyway, Lindbergh is caddy corner. Uh, and he doesn't, he's, he's a fellow who doesn't have good hearing, for one thing, for all those years of being in open cockpit planes. I've spoken to his, his daughter, Reeve, about this. And she, you know, she, she said he was, you know, kind of almost deaf in, you know, in one ear. And, you know, he, he always would ask her to enunciate more clearly and so forth. But he did not have good, his, his hearing was not good. But then, you know, to, you know, years later, so this would have been, April of 1932, when Lindbergh hears this, and then at the trial in uh, January of 1935, Lindbergh said that was Halpin's voice, and that for and that was that was really really um, really really bad for Halpin, obviously, uh, to have have this very sympathetic figure, the father. Um, Say that that was Halpin's voice. Where there, it, that, this, it, when he had earlier and said there's no way he'd be able to identify it, then he changes his, his tune and and says that that's Halpin's voice. The intermediary, uh, which is and, which is by the way a, a piece of uh, testimony that likely would never be admissible today. Yeah, well, and and, sir, and the and the defense attorney didn't challenge it. Mm -hmm. So I mean, the defense attorney. Did a very poor job as well. So, right. um, Houtman was really in, in rough shape. Who explain to me who uh, Condon, Doctor Condon, was and why he was chosen as the uh, as the intermediary and and was the meetup coordinated with the police or how, how did that how did that transpire? If you can explain that for our listeners. Sure. Uh, Dr. Condon was in his early 70s. He was a, a retired, semi-retired educator. He had been a principal in Bronx schools for many years. My grandfather knew him. Kind of, He was kind of a big blowhard. Uh, my grandfather referred to him as an old coot. They were in this Frank Bronx old-timers club together. Uh, it was kind of a social organization of men that had been in the Bronx for a long time. Anyway, uh, Condon was outraged that Lindbergh's child was kidnapped. And so he had a relationship with the editor of the Bronx Home News, which was the newspaper that my dad uh, was a, a 
newsboy, paper boy for. And anyway, uh, Condon writes a letter to the editor of the Bronx Home News uh, saying that he'd like to be helpful in returning this child to his parents. He'll offer $1,000 of his own money, so on and so forth. Well, um, the Bronx Home News then publishes a page one little squib. I mean, just a tiny, a tiny little, you know, tiny little squib in the lower right hand corner of the front page saying that Dr. Condon will offer offer to uh, act as an intermediary in the case. This isn't, that isn't exactly what he did, but that's what the newspaper said. And uh, anyway. Again, my father is the guy that is the kid that is delivering the newspaper in the area. So he's dropping off copies uh, to uh, John Knoll. Uh, and so anyway, Knoll reads this, uh, this squib in the newspaper and writes a letter to Condon and uh, saying, you may act as the intermediary. Lindbergh has said, you know, he wanted to have, some mobsters get involved and be the intermediary. And one of the ransom letters said, we're not going to accept any, any intermediary on you from your side. You know, we're going to, we're the ones in control. Um, and so John Knoll reads this or the kidnappers read this and they write, they write a letter. The kidnappers write a letter to Condon saying that he may act as the, the go between. And then he writes a, a letter to, to Lindbergh uh, saying, you know, a, uh, uh, create a you know a list of instructions uh, to follow, and, and all so, these letters appear to be in the same handwriting. Uh, probably, mm -hmm. probably. I'm not a mm -hmm. handwriting expert. And, mm -hmm. You know, um, um, the first letter looks. I mean, it looks like the indifferent the the work of an indifferent pupil in a, th a fifth rate grammar school. Um, might have been done with the opposite hand. Who knows? My, my sense is that Noel likely dictated the letters to Houtman mm -hmm. and then addressed the envelopes himself uh, and then uh, mail and took charge of mailing them. That's my that is my uh, best estimation of what happened. Um, there was actually a, a very high tech. Uh, sophisticated software program that was developed by a uh, software expert at the University of Buffalo, Dr. Sargur Srihari, and the Knowles handwriting was was uh, compared to the handwriting on the ransom envelopes, and there was a 96% probability that Knowles wrote those. But uh, wow, I don't I don't think that he wrote the uh, I. I think he most likely dictated the letters to Halpin. That's that, that's what is and, and you know the the handwriting analysts in the Lindbergh case said that this was hand, Lindbergh that was that was Halpin's handwriting in the in the in the ransom notes. But anyway, so um, the uh, so Condon calls up the Lindbergh residence late late in the night. And says he's got this letter, and then he describes this this strange symbol in the lower right hand corner, and they know it's immediately that this is this is the right people. So Condon comes out to the, the Lindbergh home very late at night, gets there pat, well past midnight, and Lindbergh sees that the symbol matches that of the earlier ransom notes, and he uh, agrees to have Condon be the intermediary. So that's how Condon got involved. Was uh, was there only the one? Uh, I'll call it a meetup, so to speak, to uh, to give the ransom money over, or was there more than one meetup? There were two. the The money had not yet been assembled, and uh, but Condon thought it, that the uh, it was a good idea to go ahead and meet with the representative of the kidnappers anyway. And so he did, although they didn't have the money. So they met the first time at Woodlawn Cemetery, and um, John Knoll was inside the cemetery. John was inside this. It's and again, this is a magnificent cemetery. Anyway, um, John gets spooked by a, a guard inside the cemetery and leaps over 
just an amazing leap over the gate, uh, the front gate at the corner of 233rd and Jerome Avenue, and runs across the street into Van Cortland Park. So anyway, uh, John agrees to send the, the baby's sleeping suit, which he had taken off the baby, uh, and uh, he said, that, that way you'll know that we have it. And, of course, this is not proof of life. And, uh, anyway, they send the sleeping suit, and uh, they arrange to have a second meeting. At the, at the second meeting at St. Raymond Cemetery in the Bronx is where the $50,000 is, is um, handed over. And that was the total amount of ransom money that was provided to the uh, purported kidnappers, correct? Correct. They they had raised it from fifty to seventy, and then Condon, at the second meeting, <laughs> negotiated John down from seventy to fifty, and which infuriated the 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 Treasury Department individuals because he took out the fifty dollar uh, four hundred. $50 bills, which would be the most uh, difficult to pass. And they, they were, they were, they, these were all gold certificates and which ultimately after president Roosevelt uh, took office and got us off the gold exchange, uh, gold standard, um, these it became illegal to, to hold, have all these ransom notes, uh, ran, excuse me, the, these gold certificates mm -hmm. and gold coins. And so this was part of the, the Treasury Department's brilliant strategy, even though at the time of the kidnapping, they were not illegal, but they they were hoping that this would this was what would happen. And sure enough, it did. And Hauptman was ultimately caught passing a ten dollar gold note at a ga Warner Quinlan gas station in upper Manhattan with and the, the gas station attendant became a little suspicious of Hauptman. And he wrote down the license plate for you, 1341, on the back of it. And ultimately, that got traced back to Halpin. And that's how he got caught. Were law enforcement involved in the two meetups at all? No. Yeah. Lindbergh refused to allow. Uh, he just wanted his child back. He didn't care about the pros prosecuting. If he got his child back, he was going to be happy. Of course, the, the child uh, was uh, was was long dead by then, uh, which obviously he did not know. But uh, no, he refused mm -hmm. to allow the uh, authorities to get involved. And of course, you would not never be able to do that. Well, I was just going to say. I mean, were law enforcement aware of what he was doing? Because if so, they it does seem like they deferred, and and understandably so to some extent. Looking back, but I don't I don't think that that would um, that would be permitted now today. No, clearly not. So, um, did Condon? Did Doctor Condon testify at the trial? He did. Interestingly, when he when Hauptman got caught, he said, "No, this is not the man." But the prosecutor, a guy, a very ambitious uh, young guy, thirty nine year old guy named David Willans, who still there's a huge law firm in uh, New Jersey bearing his name. Uh, this was a very big deal for him. He wanted to become a big Democratic Party uh, kingpin and kingmaker, and uh, he was going to do whatever, whatever it took. Uh, and so he ended up uh, changing his tune. And he was, I'm sure he was presented with a lot of evidence that showed that, Con that Houtman was involved, the ladder, the money, and handwriting, and so forth. So he changed his tune. In, in what stand. way? On the stand, or well, he, he he said that John is Bruno Richard Hauptman on the stand. So um, he completely changed his tune. He he he. Uh, he had previously given a a statement yeah, indicating I mean, otherwise. It, it, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so so he did that, and that was uh, Hauptman had to just been shaking his head as he's watching this. I mean, well, this is a nightmare. A nightmare. And there's so many, there's so many laws now, rules now related to uh, out of court identifications, in court identifications, etc. So that's another just yes. in interesting observation as to how the trial may have gone differently had it been held 
uh, today. Uh, you know, these evolution of these uh, identification <laughs> type of laws. Uh, that's well, that, one thing there is no there's no electric chair and the, there's no uh, death penalty in New Jersey now. No, that's, that's that well. is true. That is true. Hopman Hopman ever give a statement? Oh, uh, he he said. Uh, well, he he proclaimed his innocence to the end. Um, right. As did his wife clear. till her death. Well, it's very clear. I mean, he. I don't think he was ba- he was convicted is one hundred percent on circumstantial evidence. I don't think he thought he was going to get convicted, mm-hmm. and so then he would have had if he had, and if he had then confessed to having been involved in this thing, then he would have had to tell his wife, "I've been lying to you all, all along." He would have then lost the support of the German American community, which had supported him greatly. They would have thought he was a, a rat. And then but he was also very concerned about his family name and his name of his. He had, a, he had his own toddler son at the time who was born in 1933, the year after the kidnapping. And he wanted his, his son to believe that he had been. That he had been uh, unfairly, unjustly convicted, wrongfully convicted and for the rest of her life, Anna Halpin tried to clear his name with no great success. Uh, but uh, this was what was told to this Manfred Halpin all his life. Trial of the century. Wow. Well, thank you so much, uh, Robert, for sharing uh, what led you to this fascinating story and um, and and the research that you uncovered. It's um, I, I, as I shared with you before we started recording, just became interested in, in this because I am a former prosecutor, current criminal defense attorney in New Jersey and, and wanted right. to do a series on this podcast, New Jersey criminal podcast about the most famous, uh, case in New Jersey, the, the trial of the century that happened right here. And so I'm just kind of scratching the tip of the iceberg here in my, um, you know, education on this case uh, and and had a general idea of how I wanted to go about learning about it and I thought the best way to do it would be to speak with speak with the experts and so I'm just so grateful for you uh, to you for uh, sharing the story I um, I would encourage my listeners to read Cemetery John the undiscovered mastermind of the Lindbergh kidnapping Uh, and Robert you are just so well known and well respected on this topic and I um, I'm honored that you took so much time to walk us through uh, your story and, more importantly, you know, the story of the kidnapping and, and murder of Charles Lindbergh's child. Well, and my pleasure. So nice to, uh, to be with you today. And um, thank you so much for the invitation. It was a, it was a joy and a pleasure. Thank you, Robert. That concludes our conversation and this series. Don't forget to subscribe for alerts. You're going to love our upcoming guests. The best way to follow, subscribe, rate, or message the show is to visit njcriminalpodcast.com. If you're interested in starting a podcast, visit the contact page at njcriminalpodcast.com and send Meg a message. She'd love to discuss your legal podcast 